Berenice by Edgar Allan Poe. Dicevant mihi sodales, si sepulcrum amice visitarem, curas meas aliquantulum fore levatas. Eben Zayat. Misery is manifold. The wretchedness of earth is multiform. Overreaching the wide horizon as the rainbow, its hues are as various as the hues of that arch. As distinct, too, it is intimately blended. Overreaching the wide horizon as the rainbow. How is it that from beauty I have derived a type of unloveliness? From the covenant of peace, a simile of sorrow. But as in ethics, evil is a consequence of good, so in fact out of joy is sorrow born. Either the memory of past bliss is the anguish of today, or the agonies which are have their origins in the ecstasies which might have been. My baptismal name is Aegeus, that of my family I will not mention. There are no towers in the land more time-honored than my gloomy gray hereditary halls. Our line has been called a race of visionaries, and in many striking particulars, in the character of the family mansion, in the frescoes of the chief saloon, in the tapestries of the dormitories, in the chiseling of some buttresses in the armory, but more especially in the gallery of antique paintings, in the fashion of the library chamber, and lastly, in the very peculiar nature of the library's contents, there is more than sufficient evidence to warrant the belief. The recollections of my earliest years are connected with that chamber, and with its volumes, of which latter I will say no more. Here died my mother, herein was I born. But is it mere idleness to say that I had not lived before? That the soul has no previous existence? You deny it? Let us not argue the matter. Convinced myself, I seek not to convince. There is, however, a remembrance of aerial forms, of spiritual and meaning eyes, of sounds musical yet sad, a remembrance which will not be excluded, a memory like a shadow, vague, variable, indefinite, unsteady, and like a shadow too, in the impossibility of my getting rid of it while the sunlight of my reason shall exist. In that chamber was I born, thus awaking from the long night of what seemed, but was not, non-entity at once into the very regions of fairyland, into a palace of imagination, into the wild dominions of monastic thought and erudition. It is not singular that I gazed around me with a startled and ardent eye, that I loitered away my boyhood in books, and dissipated my youth in reverie. But it is singular that as years rolled away, and the nude of manhood found me still in the mansion of my fathers, it is wonderful what stagnation there fell upon the springs of my life. Wonderful how total an inversion took place in the character of my commonest thought. The realities of the world affected me as visions, and as visions only, while the wild ideas of the land of dreams became in turn not the material of my everyday existence, but in very deed that existence utterly and solely in itself. Berenice and I were cousins, and we grew up together in my paternal halls. Yet differently we grew, I, ill of health, buried in gloom. She agile, graceful, overflowing with energy. Hers the ramble on the hillside, mine the studies of the cloister. I, living within my own heart, and addicted body and soul to the most intense and painful meditation. She, roaming carelessly through life, with no thought of the shadows in her path, or the silent flight of the raven-winged hours. Berenice, I call upon her name, Berenice, and from the gray ruins of memory a thousand tumultuous recollections are startled at the sound. Ah, vividly is her image before me now, and is in the early days of her light-heartedness and joy. O oh, gorgeous yet fantastic beauty! O oh, sylph amid the shrubberies of Arnhem! O oh, Nyad among its fountains, and then, then all is mystery and terror, and a tale which should not be told. Disease, a fatal disease, fell upon the simoon of her frame, and even while I gazed upon her, the spirit of change swept over her, pervading her mind, her habits, and her character, and in a manner the most subtle and terrible, disturbing even the identity of her person. Alas! 
The destroyer came and went, and the victim, where is she? I knew her not, and knew her no longer as Berenice. Among the numerous train of maladies superinduced by that fatal and primary one, which effected a revolution of so horrible a kind in the moral and physical being of my cousin, may be mentioned as the most distressing and obstinate in its nature, a species of epilepsy, not unfrequently terminating in trance itself, trance very nearly resembling positive dissolution, and from which her manner of recovery was in most instances startlingly abrupt. In the meantime, my own disease, for I had been told that I should call it by no other appellation, my own disease then grew rapidly upon me, and assumed finally a monomaniac character of a novel and extraordinary form. Hourly and momentarily gaining vigor, and at length obtaining over me the most incomprehensible ascendancy. This monomania, if I must so term it, consisted in a morbid irritability of those properties of the mind, in the metaphysical science termed the attentive. It is more than probable that I am not understood, but I fear indeed that it is in no manner possible to convey to the mind of the merely general reader an adequate idea of the nervous intensity of interest with which, in my case, the powers of meditation, not to speak technically, busied and buried themselves in the contemplation of even the most ordinary objects of the universe. To muse for long unwearied hours, with my attention riveted to some frivolous device on the margin, or in the typography of a book, to become absorbed, for the better part of a summer's day, in a quaint shadow falling aslant upon the tapestry, or upon the floor, to lose myself for an entire night in watching the steady flame of a lamp or the embers of a fire, to dream away whole days over the perfume of a flower, to repeat monotonously some common word until the sound by the dint of frequent repetition ceased to convey any idea whatever to my mind, to lose all sense of motion or physical existence by means of absolute bodily quiescence long and obstinately persevered in. Such were a few of the most common and least pernicious vagaries, induced by a condition of the mental faculties, not indeed altogether unparalleled, but certainly bidding defiance to anything like analysis or explanation. Let me not be misapprehended. The undue, earnest, and morbid attention thus excited by objects in their own nature frivolous must not be confounded in character with that ruminating propensity common to all mankind, and more especially indulged in by persons of ardent imagination. It was not even, as might be at first supposed, an extreme condition or exaggeration of such propensity, but primarily and essentially distinct and different. In the one instance, the dreamer or enthusiast, being interested by an object usually not frivolous, imperceptibly loses sight of this object in a wilderness of deductions and suggestions issuing therefrom, until at the conclusion of a daydream, often replete with luxury, he finds the incitamentum, or the first cause of his musings, entirely vanished and forgotten. In my case, the primary object was invariably frivolous, although assuming, through the medium of my distempered vision, a refracted and unreal importance. Few deductions, if any, were made, and those few pertinaciously returning in upon the original object as a center. The meditations were never pleasurable, and at the termination of the reverie, the first cause, so far from being out of sight, had attained the supernaturally exaggerated interest which was the prevailing feature of the disease. In a word, the powers of mind more particularly exercised were, with me, as I have said before, the attentive, and are, with the daydreamer, the speculative. My books at this epoch, if they did not actually serve to irritate the disorder, partook, it will be perceived, largely in their imaginative and inconsequential nature of the characteristic qualities of the disorder itself. I will remember, among others, the treatise of the noble Italian Celius Secundus Curio, De Amplitudine Beati Reni Dei, St. Austin's great work, The City of God, and Tertullian's De Carne Christi, in which the paradoxical sentence, Mortuus est Dei Filius, credibile est quia ineptum est, et sepultus resurrexit, certum est quia impossibile est, occupied my undivided time for many weeks of laborious and fruitless investigation. 
Thus it will appear that, shaken from its balance only by trivial things, my reason bore resemblance to that ocean crag spoken of by Ptolemy Hephaestion, which steadily resisting the attacks of human violence, and the fiercer fury of the waters and the winds, trembled only to the touch of the flower called Asphodel. And although to a careless thinker it might appear a matter beyond doubt, that the alteration produced by her unhappy malady in the moral condition of Ber Berenice would afford me many objects for the exercise of that intense and abnormal meditation whose nature I have been at some trouble in explaining. Yet such was not in any degree the case. In the lucid intervals of my infirmity, her calamity indeed gave me pain, and taking deeply to heart that total wreck of her fair and gentle life, I did not fall to ponder frequently and bitterly upon the wonder-working means by which so strange a revolution had been so suddenly brought to pass. But these reflections partook not of the idiosyncrasy of my disease, and were such as would have occurred, under similar circumstances, to the ordinary mass of mankind. True to its own character, my disorder reveled in the less important but more startling changes wrought in the physical frame of Berenice, in the singular and most appalling distortion of her personal identity. During the brightest days of her unparalleled beauty, most surely I had never loved her. In the strange anomaly of my existence, feelings with me had never been of the heart, and my passions always were of the mind. Through the gray of the early morning, among the trellis shadows of the forest at noonday, and in the silence of my library at night, she had flitted by my eyes and I had not seen her, not as the living and breathing Berenice, but as the Berenice of a dream, not as a being of the earth, earthy, but as an abstraction of such a being, not as a thing to admire, but to analyze, not as an object of love, but is the theme of the most abstruse, although desultory, speculation. And now, now I shuddered in her presence, and grew pale at her approach. Yet bitterly lamenting her fallen and desolate condition, I called to mind that she loved me long, and, in an evil moment, I spoke to her of marriage. And at length the period of our nuptials was approaching, when upon an afternoon in the winter of the year, one of those unseasonably warm, calm, and misty days, which are the nurse of the beautiful Halcyon, I sat, and sat as I thought alone, in the inner apartment of the library. But uplifting my eyes, I saw that Berenice stood before me. Was it my own excited imagination, or the misty influence of the atmosphere, or the uncertain twilight of the chamber, or the gray draperies which fell around her figure? that caused in it so vacillating and indistinct an outline. I could not tell. She spoke no word, and I, not for worlds could I have uttered a syllable. An icy chill ran through my frame. A sense of insufferable anxiety oppressed me. A consuming curiosity pervaded my soul, and sinking back upon the chair I remained for some time breathless and motionless, with my eyes riveted upon her person. Alas! Its emaciation was excessive, and not one vestige of the former being lurked in any single line of the contour. My burning glances at length fell upon the face. The forehead was high and very pale, and singularly placid, and the once jetty hair fell partially over it, and overshadowed the hollow temples with innumerable ringlets, now a vivid yellow and jarringly discordant in their fantastic character with the reigning melancholy of the countenance. The eyes were lifeless and lusterless, and seemingly pupilless, and I shrank involuntarily from the glassy stare to the contemplation of the thin and shrunken lips. They parted, and in a smile of peculiar meaning, the teeth of the changed Berenice disclosed themselves slowly to my view. Would to God that I had never beheld them, or that having done so I had died, the shutting of a door disturbed me, and looking up I found that my cousin had departed from the chamber. But from the disordered chamber of my brain had not, alas, departed, and would not be driven away the white and ghastly spectrum of the teeth. Not a speck on their surface, not a shade on their enamel, not an indenture in their edges, but what that period of her smile had sufficed to brand in upon my memory. I saw them now even more unequivocally than I beheld them then. The teeth, 
the teeth. They were here and there and everywhere, invisibly and palpably before me. Long and narrow and excessively white, with the pale lips writhing about them, as in the very moment of their first terrible development. Then came the full fury of my monomania, and I struggled in vain against its strange, irresistible influence. In the multiplied objects of the external world, I had no thought but for the teeth. For these I longed with a frenzied desire. All other matters and all different interests became absorbed in their single contemplation. They, they alone, were present to the mental eye, and they and their sole individuality became the essence of my mental life. I held them in every light. I turned them in every attitude. I surveyed their characteristics. I dwelt upon their peculiarities. I pondered upon their conformation. I mused upon the alteration in their nature. I shuddered as I assigned to them, in imagination, a sensitive and sentient power, and even when unassisted by the lips, a capability of moral expression. Of Mademoiselle Salle, it has well been said, que tous ces pas étaient des sentiments, and of Berenice, I more seriously believe que toutes ces dons étaient des idées. Des idées. Ah, here was the idiotic thought that destroyed me. Des idées. And therefore, it was that I coveted them so madly. I felt their possession alone could ever restore me to peace in giving me back to reason. And the evening closed in upon me thus. And then the darkness came and tarried and went and the day again dawned, and the mists of a second night were now gathering around, and I still sat motionless in that solitary room, and still I sat buried in meditation, and still the phantasma of the teeth maintained its terrible ascendancy, as with the most vivid hideous distinctness it floated amid the changing lights and shadows of the chamber. At length there broke in upon my dreams a cry as of horror and dismay, and thereunto, after a pause, succeeded the sound of troubled voices, intermingled with many low moanings of sorrow or of pain. I arose from my seat and, throwing open one of the doors of the library, saw standing out in the antechamber a servant maid, all in tears, who told me that Berenice was no more. She had been seized with epilepsy in the early morning, and now, at the closing in of the night, the grave was ready for its tenant and all the preparations for the burial were completed. I found myself sitting in the library, and again sitting there alone. It seemed that I had newly awakened from a confused and exciting dream. I knew that it was now midnight, and I was well aware that since the setting of the sun, Berenice had been interred. But of that dreary period which intervened I had no positive, at least no definite, comprehension. Yet its memory was replete with horror horror more horrible from being vague, and terror more terrible from ambiguity. It was a fearful page in the record of my existence, written all over with dim and hideous and unintelligible recollections. I strived to decipher them, but in vain, while ever and anon like the spirit of a departed sound, the shrill and piercing shriek of a female voice seemed to be ringing in my ears. I had done a deed. What was it? I asked myself the question aloud, and the whispering echoes of the chamber answered me. What was it? On the table beside me burned a lamp, and near it lay a little box. It was of no remarkable character, and I had seen it frequently before, for it was the property of the family physician. But how came it there, upon my table, and why did I shudder in regarding it? These things were in no manner to be accounted for and my eyes at length dropped to the open pages of a book, and to a sentence underscored therein. The words were the singular but simple ones of the poet Eben Zayat. Dicebant mihi sodales, si sepulcrum amice visitarem, curas meas aliquantulum fore levatas. Why then, as I peruse them, did the hairs of my head erect themselves on end, and the blood of my body become congealed within my veins? There came a light tap at the library door, and, pale as the tenant of a tomb, a menial entered upon tiptoe. His looks were wild with terror, and he spoke to me in a voice tremulous, husky, and very low. What said he? Some broken sentences I heard. He told of a wild cry disturbing the silence of the night. 
of the gathering together of the household, of a search in the direction of the sound, and then his tones grew thrillingly distinct as he whispered me of a violated grave, of a disfigured body enshrouded, yet still breathing, still palpitating, still alive. He pointed to garments. They were muddy and clotted with gore. I spoke not, and he took me gently by the hand. It was indented with the impress of human nails. He directed my attention to some object against the wall. I looked at it for some moments. It was a spade. With a shriek I bounded to the table and grasped the box that lay upon it. But I could not force it open, and in my tremor it slipped from my hands and fell heavily, and burst into pieces, and from it with a rattling sound there rolled out some instruments of dental surgery intermingled with thirty-two small, white, ivory-looking substances that were scattered to and fro about the floor. End of Berenice